This conference will now be recorded. Okay, hello everyone. We've got a few people online. Um, I'm Jen Riley. Um, thank you for joining me at sort of uh, what is lunchtime here in, um, in Victoria. I think everybody's Victoria based actually. Now I have popped you all on mute um, just so that we don't get lots and lots of feedback, um, but we'll take you off uh, mute as we go. Um, I was going to put a little webcam on just for a second so I can say hello to you all and you can see me. Um, but we will be using a lot of the screen. Look, there I am. Hello. Can you see me? You can write in the little chat function whether or not you can see me. Can you see me? Use the chat function as a good way to talk to everyone. Okay. All right. Well, back to, um, to, to the um, presentation. We've got quite a bit to cover, but it would be great if everyone could just say hello in the chat, just so I know you're there. Jenny said good day. Anybody else want to say hi in the chat function? Oh, there's Emily, Emily, Alyssa, and Michelle. Christine, can you make me the presenter? Um, hmm. uh, Belinda Smith, can you see me? Yes. Oh, Catherine, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, we've got some chat happening. Great. People are, are online and, and off and going. So, so we're here today. Um, open um, asked us to do these webinars for you. So we've got um, three sessions that we're going to run over the next couple of weeks. Today is about how do we measure outcomes. Um, Many of you may have already seen this sort of material. Some people are troubleshooting a few issues, but everybody else can hear me okay, I take it. Um, so how do we measure outcomes? Selecting indicators and targets to measure outcomes and selecting data collection methods. So I wanted to start off by asking you all though, um, what is, one thing you want to know about measuring outcomes. I'm really hoping I'm going to cover it. But go ahead, write in there sort of one thing you'd really like to know about. It's getting a few comments up there. Balancing short and long-term progress. That's a good one, Marianne. Identification. We'll definitely get into that, Catherine. Development of tools. Any other sort of comments from people? I know you know where the chat function is because you all said hello. So um, keep those comments coming. What are the latest DHHS tools? Yeah, we, we certainly um, will touch base on the outcomes architecture. Perhaps we can talk more, Christine, about what the DHHS tools are you referring to. Okay, so there's a few ideas there. Yeah, defining them, what they are, what they're not. We're gonna talk about language because that comes up a lot. Any other last sort of thoughts about what you'd like to know? Okay, well, we will move into, these are the sort of learning objectives we've come up with today. You know, reviewing what it is, um, understanding the, the what, who and when of measuring outcomes, the how to select indicators to to measure them and we'll have a look at some of the data collection tools. So there's quite a lot. I've made sure it's a pretty jam-packed session, you know, um, and you'll also get the slide deck as well. So you get the slide deck. We are recording this, so you can also have access to this as well um, via, via um, 
when that gets sent out. <laughs> Merging with Iris, wow. That um, I think that is the, the future, isn't it? It's, it's connecting all these big systems. Um, so let's let's get into the content. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present some content, try and make this as interactive as possible, um, get you to do activities as we go, because sitting there listening to me for an hour um, is is can be can be a bit boring without some interactivity. So we've tried to put plenty of activity in. But as I'm going, feel free to pop some questions in the chat function or points of clarification or even just comments. Um, you know, keep the conversation conversation going. It's a bit like Q&A, but just with me. So reviewing outcomes, let's start with this as a, as a starter. On a scale of one to five, what is your level of comfort? One being um, what's an outcome, and five, I have a PhD in outcomes and I'm all over it. I'm going to put myself in there at about a four and a half. Um, everybody else? One, two, well, that's good. At least some people are going to get something out of today's session then. Oh, cool. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Marianne, Christine, Laura. So terrific. Okay, that's good to know. Just a little bit of a sort of sense where everybody's at. I have done this work now for, for 20 years in the social sector. And this was, and I worked at United Way um, for a period of time. And this was actually one of the, the neatest descriptions I thought about what an outcome is. I mean, it can be a lot more, it can be a lot less, you know, many more different things. But I quite like the way that it is described as a benefit or a change for individuals or organisations participating in a program or in initiatives. And changes in what people are doing, thinking, knowing, um, what the condition is, and using the neat little acronym BACKS, B-A-C-K-S. And if you apply that as a bit of a test, you know, when you write an outcome down and say, well, is it a behaviour, is it an attitude, is it a, is it a condition, like a health condition um, or a circumstance, um, such as access to, access to things is sometimes debatable, but, you know, knowledge and skills. But generally, if it's one of those, you're on the right track. And... When we write about outcomes, we generally talk about increasing or decreasing something because they're about change um, or, you know, re reducing as well, increase, decrease or reduce. So it's not 100% perfect because some people would say, well, there are other types of outcomes, that, you know, um, that aren't listed there, but it's a good way to start. So hang on to backs as we go through this. And I think it's important that outcomes is a mindset. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about what outcomes versus outputs is, because this is also useful to understand what something is by understanding what it's not. And often output and outcome really do get mixed up. And so an output, and often when I do this training face-to-face, -face, is I'll stand one side of the room and I'll say, this is what we have produced, what we as a service system have produced or delivered, you know, um, number of workshops, number of client sessions, number of beds, you know, you know, it's the services or the products that we do. And then the outcome, I walk over to the other side of the room, I said, well, this is the benefit to the clients. So this is about their experience. It's about what, what's changing for them. So the question could be, what did we do versus what difference did we make? Outputs, you can generally, you can uh, put a number on them, so the widgets, number of programs, number of services, number of trainings, workshops. Um, outcomes are the difference made by these things. So, in, so for instance, children safe in a car is the outcome you'd hope from a car seat. Or attending a workshop or a parenting program or coming and having a, a case consultation, you'd hope that they've increased their knowledge, their skills or experience. What difference did it make to them? But you need both. I mean, there seems, you know, there's not really a hierarchy here. You need an output to enable an outcome, you know, so you need to do something. And an outcome, such as a change in behaviour, often need an output, something's happened. So I quite like that one um, in terms of what it is versus 
an output versus an outcome. Because I think people get quite confused between the two of them. So going into, I started to talk about this, about the outcomes mindset. It requires us to start with the client. And this is what we do, you know, in our work. We always put uh, people at the centre of our work. We all, we're constantly thinking about what are their challenges, what are their needs, what are their issues, their constraints. You know, putting ourselves in their shoes, you know, what can we create that will change their situation for the better? So I think we work like this anyway. It's just putting this language of outcomes and outputs around it. Is there any questions as I'm going? Feel free to pop them in the chat box there. So I think, you know, in this sort of human-centred design that we're all in at the moment or, you know, whatever, um, you know, client-centred language we're using, it's just meaning that, you know, we are really starting with the end in mind. And sometimes it means we've got to look at our outputs because they might not be the right uh, pr product or service to change what we want. So it's a really good chance to say, well, does A lead to B? You know, and I, the example I put up there is that, you know, this is tens of thousands of apps out there of mobile phones, but how many of those have improved lives? And I think we've all been part of a service occasionally along the way where there's been a lot of focus on delivery and sort of less about, well, has it really improved the lives of those that we're working for? And, and it, the focus on outputs has been because government for a long time has requested output uh, contracts you know we have to report on outputs and so our focus has been on on those outputs um, and so I think we've become very good at measuring outputs and but really I think uh, the towards outcomes measurement helps us sort of answer the question well so what we've been very very busy but what are we changing um, and, and putting some as I said some language around this So what does an outcome mindset mean for program managers? You know, it's shifting this focus from are we working to deliver a service to are we working to improve the health and well-being of families, children, and their community? I mean, ultimately, we've got to hold both. We've got to have an outcome mindset, but we've still got to keep measuring those outputs and ideally lining the two up. Okay, let's do some practice, see if this has gone in. So outputs are what we produced to create outcomes written from our perspective. That's another good way to do it is, is write it from you. And outcomes, you can write as I statements. So for, um, you know, Andy here, Andy's outcome might be that there's been a change in her, her knowledge or um, a increase in skill so she's able to ride a bike you know you can put that in i statements sometimes you know when we write them in a bigger diagram we'll remove the i statements but if you write it as i this is what's changed for me um that helps you know make it make it really real okay all right so who's become really good at identifying outcomes in terms of the experience of the user is the commercial sector so i've got a couple of fun examples for you Okay, so looking at this, what is the output and what is the outcome? You want to have a go? Pop it in this, um, this chat function. What's the output? What's been produced or delivered by the company? And what is the outcome? Well, apparent, apparently the outcome according to Coke. You may have some few other outcomes. That's right. <laughs> yeah, this is right. Happiness, apparently. Output is an advert. That's very clever. It is indeed. It is the out the advert is an output? That's right. But in the advert, what's the output? <laughs> Happiness, sugar high is the outcome. Well, that's right. This is. I've had a few other people do this training, and they'll say, "Well, you know, diabetes." But 
I think what's interesting is they're not focused on the output. They're not telling you that they've distributed 1 million bottles of Coke. They're telling you um, about the outcome. The next one I quite like is this one. What's the output and what's the outcome? And again, there might be some unintended outcomes of, of this um, output. What do you think? <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> I had someone, I'm laughing, I don't know if everyone see Catherine's comment, but the, the heteronormative, heteronormative bliss. I had someone say to me, especially with that green line around the family, that it, it, it put a whole new meaning to nuclear family. Yeah. <laughs> Turning green is the unintended outcome, quite like that. Uh, yeah, and what, super bugs as well, I think, was the other sort of, yeah. Are oh, you really exactly, Marianne? So some great questions and comments there. Um, <laughs> we do have a worrying green glow. Um, so, um, but I think it's just, I kind of wanted something that sort of st stuck in your mind when you were thinking about what's been produced what's versus, versus what's the apparent changes uh, for, the, for the end user. So hopefully that, that sort of helps. Okay, so, um, we're now moving into a little bit of a review of theory of change program logic because like one of the things that flows from you know this identification of, of outcomes is well how do you come up with an outcome? And so we start with the end in mind. You know, we often use big shower curtains or sticky walls or posters on the wall and get some post-it notes or, or whatever and sort of say, well, what's the what's the change we're seeking to create? And ideally, you would do this with community, you know, ideally, rather than in a room without them. But you'd sort of work alongside the people that are wanting the change and say, well, what is it? Um, and then working out where you are now and then where do you want to be and sort of working out an outcomes chain or a theory of change or a program logic. These words, these phrases get used interchangeably, but ultimately it is a, um, a often a schematic, a drawing that explains a series of outcomes that lead to, to other outcomes. And I'll go into this into more detail. So we call the language I use a lot is theory of change. And I've got a nice diagram that explains the difference between a theory of change and a program logic. So basically a theory of change is a description and an illustration of how and why a desired change is expected to happen. So we hear this term a lot in our sector now. Um, and there can be, those theories can actually be based on documented and evidence-based theories of change. And, and you um, in the sort of health sector would know, you know, a lot around diffusion theory or, you know, sort of universal models. There's all sorts of theories that you will work in, especially anyone who's done psychology, you know, understands the sort of social modeling. Um, drug and alcohol sector uses stages of change theory. Um, innovation, we're increasingly talking about diffusion theory, you know, early adopters, late adopters and, and so on. So we talk a lot about these sorts of these theories all the time. And in your work, they're often implicit. Um, that if someone comes in and if we work with their immediate needs, then we'll help them, you know, realise uh, other needs later on. You know, that's like a massive hierarchy of needs approach. You know, we, we have these ways of working. And so what a theory of change does is makes it more explicit, the change that you're making. And what these theories of change help us do is help us identify these long-term, medium-term and short-term outcomes. So I think this was something someone raised right at the beginning, is how do you identify short-term and long-term outcomes? And my answer would be, you'd have a theory of change or program logic, the ones uh, that are short, that are closer to the, the output are your short-term and the, the further you get away is long-term. Here are some pictures. So you've all seen something that looks a little bit like this. These are often referred to as theories of change documents. 
Um, this one down in the bottom left hand corner is probably a little more like a, a program logic. I'll show you this next slide because I think this is a nice depiction and it's really worth reading this article. It's a blog article on theory of change versus logical framework. And it's a really uh, nice way to sort of say, well, the theory of change is often quite messy and quite complex and explains all the levers of change and if this, then this, and um, you know, our assumptions are, and if, if we use a bit of social modeling and a bit of expert, you know, um, advice, you know, if we, you can sort of write down, you know, it's often things go in, in loops, you know, as positive reinforcement loops, and you can make this a really messy sort of drawing that gets it all out. But often you don't want to share all of that with your funders or, you know, or, or other stakeholders. So often the logical framework is what your program is doing um, in terms of activity, outputs and outcomes and goals. But ideally you have both. Um, I would strongly recommend because often the logical framework alone doesn't capture all of that implicit theory um, and assumptions. I'm going a lot into uh, the more evaluation side of things, but I think it's it's I think it's important to sort of understand what things are versus what what, what they're not. Any comments? Is that useful in terms of just mentioning how theory of change links in with outcomes? Or has everyone decided to go for lunch? <laughs> I'm going to take somebody off mute in a minute. Any, any comments? Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> Christine's thinking. That's right, yeah. Whenever I, I get in a room and do theory of change with, with workers and, and often clients, it always, it's always there. It's always, I, I just sort of have to just sort of drag it out of people and I go, yeah, but then what happens? What do you think happens then? And, and everyone knows it, you know, you just have to sort of get it out and put it in this language. And it's important to do because there's a lot of um, assumptions in teams about how change happens. And it's important to sort of pull that out so you can be, uh, doc document it and then measure it. <laughs> how do you solve it? You don't solve theories of change, uh, you test them. So you put a theory of change out there and you say, if, if uh, children uh, come to us and if we give them, you know, three-year-old kinder, then they'll get better in educational outcomes, then good things will happen. And then you measure it. Um, yeah, I don't think we, we don't solve it. Okay, wonderful. So that's just a, a little bit about logic models. So back to a bit more on outcomes. And this will all sort of start to fit together. So who has outcomes? And look, everyone has outcomes. Um, individuals, young people, clients, families, um, family members, staff, volunteers, policy makers, funders. Often you have to work through someone to get to somebody else. So um, for instance, like a GP, you might, a number of programs I've worked with um, We've worked with GPs and got knowledge and skills in GPs and trying for some attitude change perhaps sometimes. And if they change, we call them the intermediate outcome, where the theory is then they'll pass that information on or they'll behave differently towards a client who's coming in. So that's more intermediary, but it's still, you know, important. So I put up this, um, many of you be familiar with the um, Bronnen, Fennen, Brennan, a social ecology, but the idea, um, you know, that that change happens at multiple levels across a system. And so we might be working at the level of the individual, or as I said, we might be working with, many of you work with micro systems, you're working with the family or the siblings or the teachers. Um, and then that's sort of the next level out, sort of the extended family, neighbourhoods, mass media, right out to the macro system. And, and many of you will be working in your own systems, um, that affects you know, how, how people experience the service system. So I think it's important to sort of identify who um, you're talking about with these outcomes, you know, um, and, at, and at what level of the system as well you're, you're working in to ch create change. So the next one is, is when. Um, 
when do we have outcomes? And I mentioned before this thing about short-term, medium-term and long-term. So this is an example. Um, the long-term aim of this program might be reduction in blood pressure. So that's, that's a condition. The medium term um, could be the increased rate of exercise. So that's what we want to see happening to result in long-term change. And the short-term change might be improved knowledge of a healthy lifestyle. So this is a bit of a classic, um, it's very, very simplified sort of health promotion program, perhaps that a workplace would put on. Um, you know, if, again, the theory of change, the theory being if we improve people's knowledge of a healthy lifestyle, so if we tell them, you know, they need to exercise and eat less chocolate, then ideally, you know, behaviour change will take place. This is this is a theory, okay, people, this doesn't necessarily happen. Um, we will increase the rate of daily exercise and then if we increase the rate of, rate of daily exercise, there is an evidence base to say that, you know, that has, that has good, good results for, for health. But I think what you can do is once you've written this down, then you can sort of test the assumption. And of course, the almighty assumption in this one is, anyone want to have a have a go? What's the assumption between someone improving their knowledge and someone changing their behaviour? I know somebody knows the answers to that. It's much more fun doing this in a room because then I can pull on people. Yeah, exactly, Catherine. They'll have the motivation. I mean, if it was that simple that knowledge led to behaviour change, then I wouldn't eat chocolate and I'd be at the gym three times a week. Exactly. So we need to look at different theories. Um, but I think what I'm trying to show you here is that there are short, medium, long term. Um, and often it's multiple short term outcomes. It might be improving knowledge. It might be a bit of peer pressure. It might be a bit of um, positive reinforcement um, you know, and so on. And that might lead to that behavior change. And I've given some examples down the side here about what, what sorts of outcomes you sort of expect in the short term, such as, you know, learning, awareness, skills, opinions, aspirations, motivations, you know, and then medium term. This is really rough. I mean, you can have behaviour change overnight. You know, you bring in seatbelt laws and all of a sudden everyone changes their behaviour. You know, you can, you can, these things um, might not fit in these time frames, but I'm just trying to show you a bit of, the logic here um, about you know if this then this leads to this but certainly social economic environmental and civic and, and even our own personal conditions take a long time much more than a you know I've got a year plus here I mean things like social change can take you know a generation but what we're interested in our sector is well what are the realistic short-term outcomes that we can identify and measure um, as the result of, of our actions, of our service delivery. Um, and that, that's certainly an activity worth, worth you doing. And I often get people to do this with post-it notes in groups and sort of say, well, what's your service? And then, you know, put that in one colour and then sort of say, well, what are the immediate changes you're hoping will happen? Uh, what's your intention? And then you can go and sort of test those. The other piece of language I thought worth sharing here is that we often talk about objectives. I'm not going to labour on this, but, you know, what's an objective versus an outcome? Objectives is what we intend to do. Um, they're often written in sort of strategic plans. Um, but outcomes um, is what we hope, you know, people will achieve. And that's written from the perspective of a beneficiary. The people that are really, are really good at identifying objectives and outcomes as teachers because they'll, they'll write learning objectives from the perspective of the teacher and then they'll write learning outcomes from the perspective of the student. So just, just a bit of clarity there about objectives versus outcomes. So moving through, so we've got lots to cover and we are halfway. Hang in there. Um, so population level outcomes. Um, this is the language of results-based accountability, um, which is an approach to doing outcomes measurement. So this is quite useful, this distinction between population and program level outcomes. Um, 
So program level outcomes can also be thought about in terms of process and impact as well. So the means versus the ends. If that's useful, use it. If it's not, just keep it to short term, medium term, long term, and you know, we can, we can get caught up in language and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that again later. And I think uh, Friedman, who wrote the book about um, doing good's not good enough, which is the sort of results-based accountability, is he makes this point that population accountability is a shared responsibility. And increasingly we're seeing that language come into collective impact that, you know, a shared agenda requires um, population level change is can't be done alone by one agency that's going to take um, you know a village it's going to take multi-stakeholders from different st sectors but program accountability um, that we take responsibility for what our program outcome and it's not reasonable to have accountability at a program for a whole population level change so we often just or a dotted line at the top of the theory of change and say that's what we're contributing to at a population level. Um, I think I've got some examples here about population. You know, well, peace, there you go. All ch Aboriginal children fulfil their potential in Australia, clean environment, residents, safe community, you know, all children start school ready. You know, no one agency or program can make this happen. It is a, a shared, shared responsibility. That's where collective impact comes to the rescue. Another example that's used perhaps in a, you know, um, in Shepparton by 2025, the percentage or number of children developmentally on track in Shepparton, population level outcome. But the program level outcome will be, you'll, through, through the program, will provide long-term relation-based pre and postnatal and antenatal care for expectant new mothers. I think that's more of an output. What would be the outcome for that? If, that, if we were going to provide maternal health program and provide long-term relationship pre and postnatal and antenatal care, that is certainly something we do, we deliver. What would be the program level outcome, which I'm now going to rewrite because I didn't write the slide, what would it be? What would that program outcome be? Because that is certainly an output. Is the how? Anyone want to have a go? So we were delivering a service for expectant mums and new mums. And providing care, what would we hope would be the outcome for that group for those for those mums? I'd be hoping for better health and well-being. Anyone got some ideas? Better health and well-being of those women, maybe more breastfeeding, um, better developmental outcomes for the kids. But I would argue that that isn't a program outcome. It's more program output, which I will be updating immediately following this. See, it's very easy. Here we go. Marianne, thank you. Expectant and new mothers have better health and empowered to engage with services. Absolutely. So there's a relationship um, that they feel um, confident and, and able to demand their rights and, you know, attend those services. Thank you, Marianne, for letting me hang out there. Christine, outcomes, the education levels rise for children. I don't, as a result, if that was a program, the program is a maternal health program, and long term, yes, you kept better education levels because that'd be, you know, that, that maternal health program should be looking at short term um, sort of developmental milestones and absolutely attachment, yeah. So we'll update that outcome. See, it's easy, easy for me, or oh, it wasn't me that did it, but my, for my project officer to pull back into output thinking. All right, so um, oh, what happened there? so why why bother? Why why measure outcomes? It takes a lot of effort. Um, I normally get people to brainstorm this, but I'm going to keep us moving. But some of the examples that are useful to sort of uh, give back to you know managers and others 
or staff when they say, well, this is taking a lot of effort and taking up a lot of time. I think there's some very good reasons about why we measure outcomes. Uh, least of all, we are going to be moving to a bit more of an outcomes focused um, contracting servicing model, I, I'm sure, in the, you know, the way that New South Wales and Queensland have gone. So um, not in the short term, but I think you know, that's where it's all heading. So there are some of the good reasons. So a and a back to you guys. How, what, how are you currently measuring your results? Um, what's, what's one way you already um, are measuring this or imagine doing in your current context um, to measure, measure success or measure results? So we're moving into measuring of outcomes now. Any thoughts? I'm going to call on. I'm going to call on someone. Let's have somebody else talk for a minute. Marianne, I'm calling on you. If that's okay, tell us about how you are measuring results currently. You're you're off mute. I can't hear you. Can everybody else hear? Marianne. Having any luck, Catherine? Do you want to have a go? Taking you Hi. ladies off. There. Oh, hey. who have we got? Uh, this is Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hey. What do you? Um, so Sorry. some of the programs um, here are evaluated using pre and post surveys um, and then there are some kind of post reflective um, interviews and that kind of thing that are used also but we're starting up some new um, prevention programs um, and so I think it's going to be a bit trickier to like they're just going to be a bit different in terms of evaluation and so that's why I'm kind of here to get some ideas. Awesome and so where are you from Catherine? Uh, I'm from Canada but I'm working in Melbourne. <laughs> what service? <laughs> uh, Drummond Street. Drummond Street, wonderful. Oh, mm -hmm. great to have you. Cool. So you're doing you're doing some pre pre and post. Okay, at the moment, wonderful. Um, is there a particular uh, domains or questions you, you're focused on? Uh, I mean, it depends. There are a lot of programs, so it depends on the program. You know, there are some kind of relationship type. Um, programs so the questions sort of reflect those things uh, and then like you know the AOD program would have different sort of questions that are being asked. Awesome okay mm -hmm. wonderful thank you. Mm -hmm. Now who else can I call on? There's a gaggle of people somewhere where are you Emily, Alicia and Michelle there's a party going on over here. Ladies what um what are you currently doing? Like what here is there on like a little telephone? Are you all on? Are you on mute? You're on, you muted yourselves? No, I'm not getting anything. God, this is what it's like to be on radio, you know, and they just get they get they get nothing. Who else wants to talk? Put your hand up. Maybe I can call out on you. Jenny Carmichael. Where's Jenny? I'm just calling out people that've been very active on the on the chat thing. There's a, there's an incentive. Okay, well, we might. There's Jenny. See if I can get Jenny talking. You talking, Jenny? It takes a few seconds. Sometimes there's a lag. No, or people might just have mouthfuls of lunch. <laughs> okay, all right. We'll go back to uh, the presentation, but um, thank you, Catherine. That was great. So, how do we measure? So, we set targets and indicators. We use indicators and targets to help us know if we're achieving our outcomes. And this is sort of the middle step, I guess, before we start putting together questionnaires and things. Um, the questionnaire is often the tool. So let's go through this. Outcomes are statements and the indicators are metrics and targets are, are you know, are expected or are hoped for 
results. So here's an example. So an outcome. I was recently working on a drug and alcohol project, and the outcome was their, their intention, so a decrease or increase in a condition, reduction in the client's depression. Now, the tool that they were using was the K10, the Kessler 10 questionnaire to measure depression. So the measure was the score. The indicator of depression was um, people scoring above 20. So that's the standard that's set by the creators of the tool. So that's the, the indicator. And the target was to reduce the percentage of clients scoring above 20 um, you know, after three months. So you can see that target's quite smart. It's quite specific, measurable, achievable. I hope it's achievable for them. Um, realistic and, and time bound. And look, generally indicators and targets are quantitative. They use a number value or, or percentage. So I think if anything you get out of today, even just having a printout of this one screen to sort of say, well, this is one way to break it down. Sometimes the language is slightly different. Um, and I think, I think it'd be good to sort of talk about the Victorian um, outcomes architecture because it's slightly different to this. I guess I'm coming, I come from the, I've come out of the international development sector, I'm sort of working with World Bank and United Nations and Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And, you know, the international sector has sort of 20, 30 years of monitoring and evaluation. And these are sort of the, the way that we've talked about outcomes and outputs and theories of change and so on. Um, so this is, this is one way, but sometimes people have slightly different ways of doing it. Um, I'll give you an example, but I think what's, the key message here is that as a group or as an organisation, you're clear about what an outcome is or an indicator or a target or a measure. You have your own, you know, when you put together a document, your, your measurement framework, you just be clear internally about what you mean. And so I want to show you the Victorian government architecture that um, you'll, you'll see in the, many of the documents that are coming out. And, and especially this sort of bit here about measuring success. They have a, their outcome statements are very, very high level, um, often sort of population level. And then that outcome indicator is the nature and direction of the change required. So I often refer to an outcome as a reduction or a, uh, an increase or a decrease in, in something. And that's generally how it's talked about. Um, the Victorian government's sort of gone down this, well, an outcome indicator and an outcome measure. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an awkward sort of um, unalignment, but I think it's just worth putting that out so that when you look at this and you look at the training that I've given you, you can sort of go, well, we'll rename it this um, for the sake of this report or we'll, we'll, or we'll write it in the way we want to write it, give it to government. You know, you, you have to sort of negotiate this. It's the same with any, you know, some different funders have slightly different language around things. But I think as long as you're clear and you put a definition in of what you believe an outcome and an indicator and a measure is, um, and then you get on with it, that's what's, that's what's most important. So there's a slight nuance in difference, especially around outcome and an outcome indicator um, that I've outlined in my, my slides to you. So we've said up here, I'll go back up to this, how we measure. Um, an outcome indicator, well, the outcome that we've said here is reduction. So in the DHHS guidelines, they will call this outcome an outcome indicator. Um, and then the indicator of depression that we've, we've got there as our indicator, they're referring to that as a measure. So slightly different. Um, as I said, that's that's the direction that the Victorian state government's gone, but the rest of the world has gone another way. So um, I'm, I'm with the rest of the world. So um, I will I'll, I'll leave that with you, and I'm happy to um, provide any more clarification on that, maybe offline, if anybody has any more questions about that.
Right, okay, so indicators. Let's dive a little bit deeper into indicators. Okay, so we have an indicator of 12. Right, what does that mean? Um, so what makes for a good indicator? Um, there's a couple of filters or things that we can use. Uh, one is called AIMS, which is a simple test developed by the New Economics Foundation that says it is action focused, it's important, it's measurable, it's simple. Um, another set of criteria is when you select um, an indicator, so why would you select um, when I'm, you know, a particular children are kept read to daily or um, the L17s for family violence. When you pick these indicators, you need to make sure that they're representative of what you're trying to um, report on, the outcomes, which is why something uh, like L17s is important because else the L17s are the forms that the police complete when they're called out to a family violence incident. But that doesn't mean that that is the actual representation of the you know, family violence that's happening. All that tells you is that that was the number that were reported. And as we all know, the difference between what's reported versus what's not reported, um, it can be quite different. So I think we just need to be very clear about, is it representative of the phenomenon that we're trying to measure? Um, so is it understandable? Um, there are some indicators out there that, you know, nobody knows what they mean. So, you know, try and get something that, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily need quantum physics to understand because they need to be communicable, communicatable. Um, relevant, obviously, cost, you know, sometimes it costs money to collect data. Um, are they accessible? Are they timely? Um, you know, like for instance, where are they? Are they online? Can you download them? Or have you got to go to, a, you know, go to somewhere to get the information? Are they timely? Do they come out every three years? You know, it's, it might be that the ABS data is free, but, you know, it's not particularly timely. And it may not be that accurate anyway. Um, and are they valid? And I think, you know, looking into um, what is fantastic that uh, Vicky Sinnott and the team at DHHS done is that data dictionary where they've gone through and actually looked at the validity of all the measures that they've recommended for the outcomes framework. So all that work is really useful in selecting indicators. Um, I've got a couple of examples. Um, I want to talk to. So some of the indicators that we would use are the percentage of clients scoring above 20 in the K10. So that was our indicator for um, reducing depression. Here's another one, uh, percentage of unauthorised absences for a class. Anyone want to have a go at what the outcome would be? Like if that's the indicator, what do you think we're trying, what's the outcome? What's the um, the other side of the coin for this indicator? Anyone want to have a go? So it's going to be something about the students. So we're, we're trying to increase or decrease something to do with the students. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Christine, student engagement. So, and the thing is, is, is um, you wouldn't want to use that all by itself because just because the kids are there doesn't mean they're necessarily engaged, but it's it's an indicator. It gives us some indication that they're not in the classroom, they're certainly not learning, they're certainly not engaged. So, um, yeah, spot on, thank you. Um, percentage of clients with a score of five or more and an A top on the scale. So again, that's, that's a physical well-being one, um, increased physical well-being using um, the ATOP score, which is the uh, alcohol um, treatment outcome measure. So there are, so there's sort of, as I said before, the, the, the outcome is on one side of the coin and then the indicators on the other side. So what, what are you doing to sort of, what, what, what is indicating that we're achieving that outcome? Um, sometimes you can have um, a couple of indicators for an outcome and, and I would recommend that to make it really robust. Um, just a note here about um, indicators being misleading. Um, and I'm not going to go into all of this detail, but I will give it to you to read. But just why indicators can be misleading. I've talked a little bit about that, about, um, you know, sort of making sure it's the, the right indicator. You know, L17 is not being the indicator of the rate of violence. It's the rate of re reported violence. 
Um, you know, and some notes about language, um, the number of and proportion of, um, you know, when we use this sort of language. Um, so this is useful. And so in summary, I think measure, imp, indicators measure progress towards our, and you can have indicators for outputs, but in terms of outcomes, they measure progress towards an outcome. So you need them. We have focused in this conversation mostly about quantitative um, indicators. There are qualitative indicators, but we've focused on the, the number ones. Um, and ideally, um, they should be specific about who, who we're referring to and the desired change. So um, and, you know, I've given you some criteria to sort of put those indicators through to make sure that they are um, you know, the right indicator for the outcome things to think about in terms of cost and timeliness. So we're on the home stretch. Um, it's been another sort of 10 minutes. And I did, I, I've, got some, um, I've got some information here about targets, which is quite useful in terms of, you know, setting targets, some ideas, you know, stretch versus um, an unrealistic target. You know, so there's some information there on that. Again, I, I want to move through this. Um, because uh, the purpose of that today was to get you around outcomes, but there's just a little bit extra there about sort of what are targets. Um, so I think, you know, what makes a good outcome target? You know, there's some examples there. Focuses us on a destination, and I think that's useful, um, especially for, um, so, so for, for planning. And... Um, so just a, a little bit of a test there. Number of applications for a job. Is that an indicator or a target? Who wants to have a quick go at that one? Make sure you're still awake in this last five minutes. Number of applications for a job. Is it an indicator or a target? Yeah, thanks, Andy. It's, a, it's an indicator. A target would be, um, let's get 100 applications for the job. Uh, the next one, level of client satisfaction. That would be an indicator. If it was a target, you'd go for 100% client satisfaction. There's another example there, but we will just we'll keep on moving. So in terms of collecting data, we are going to go into this a lot more um, in I think it's next week's session. We're going to go into collecting data and analysing outcome data um, and reporting on it. But just um, there are probably many that you're already using. I mean, uh, I think Catherine talked about using pre and post surveys as a, as a method for collecting data. Um, I can look, and there's so much data out there as well. You know, there's already, you know, you do case notes, uh, you have lots of information about what people, people coming and going and getting them to sort of fill out various uh, sort of experience surveys and, um, you know, and, and increasingly, you know, we're moving towards things like the Internet of Things where, um, you know, we're able to track the number of people walking through a door or we're collecting feedback on a smiley face as they walk out the door. Um, you know, the, there are different different ways to collect data. And many of the traditional uh, data collection things is to use existing data, so those sort of admin data sets that you already have. But there's also some things like meeting minutes and annual reports. Surveys, we've referred to, many of you have probably used them. Um, interviews uh, and focus groups and, and observations, again, that many many people working in case consultation will, will make those. So they, they, they are sort of uh, data collection methods. And some of the newer ones that we're seeing are more participatory, so where the data is collected by, uh, by the client. So, you know, uh, collecting stories of change that's worth looking into that. Or taking photos, I worked in an Aboriginal program where we gave a bunch of young fellows photo cameras and they went around and collected photos of things that it represented um, what was going on in their lives and what was changing. And increasingly we're moving towards more uh, technological um, information 
such as site analytics, um, surveys being collected by, by text messaging and getting information of Facebook, uh, data logging um, and GPS mapping data. So there, these sorts of tools are starting to come in as well in, in terms of collecting, collecting information, uh, information community, communication technology. So I, I've raced through, I apologise, raced through the sort of targets piece there and I've just sort of just given you a little bit of a flavour about data collection methods and we will go into it more, more, uh, you know, more in the next couple of sessions. But while we've sort of got sort of five, um, five minutes, is there anything out of today um, that you've got a question about or is there something that you'd like to give me some feedback on that's you'd like to delve deeper into in the next session that you know we went through today. Maybe we can um I'd love to say you all off mute, but the thing is there's about 20 of us on the line and then it gets a bit crazy. So I'm not sure, um, if you couldn't mind sort of writing that down, um, what your thoughts are. What we are covering in the next session will be the role of evaluation questions and framing outcomes, measurement. Um, data collection methods and so on. And look, there is a lot more um, that we offer in terms of face-to-face -face training and most of this was taken from our face-to-face -face training. Is that D? Yes, it is Simone. And um, Simone's asked, is that DHHS assessment of indicators available publicly? What, what I've referred to is their data dictionary. And if you type in to Google DHHS wellbeing and health outcomes framework data dictionary, um, and I will find the link um, and, and pass it around. I just don't want to turn off my um, screen. Um, I might not put it back up again. But if you type that in, um, it's the DHS, I'm just going to write it in here. DHS Wellbeing um, and Health. Somebody else might be able to access it. Outcomes Framework. And it's the data dictionary that, that goes with the framework. Absolutely. Andy, Andy's just asked um, if she can get a recording when she's back at work of the next two sessions. Absolutely, we will be recording. Um, oh, thanks, Emily and Lisa and Michelle. Hope that was useful. I hope you got something out of it. It was a lot, we jam packed a lot in that session, but um, as I said, hopefully, what you, we did get out of it is a bit of some, some clarity around language or at least how to have a conversation about that. Um, and hopefully that that is that is useful as well. I think so much of it is about just getting those concepts and some sort of clarity. Um, lovely. I'm glad. Hope you have some uh, good conversations. Um, and look, I'm my email. I don't think it's on anything. That is. If there's something you'd like some more information on, that's me, uh, Jim Riley, Jim Riley at Clear Horizon. Um, and yes, um, Emily will. Um, send the slides and we'll be putting all the recordings onto the open portal um, soon. Um, so um, I'm sure there'll be other bits and pieces. Feel free to either send through to me or Emily. Emily, do you want to pop your email in there? Who um, organised me to do today. So thank you. Thanks to the team there. Emily, you, don't, you said before you don't have a microphone. I can't even throw to you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if okay, gents on the line, um, if we do, thanks for coming. It's one o'clock. Enjoy the rest of your day.